Now I tested the recording beforehand. This should work, I hope. Uh, sorry about yesterday. Uh, although, interestingly enough, the video from last year actually covered the same exact number of slides. So I ended off on the right same area. So there's something to be said for my consistency uh, in giving these lectures. So there you go. Uh, but in light of your uh, lab today, I found a joke that I thought would be somewhat appropriate. If you're willing to hear it. Okay. So out in the forest, there was this mole hole, and there was a papa mole, there was a mama mole, and there's a baby mole. And so one day, the papa mole thought he smelled something very sweet. So he stuck his head out of the mole hole. He's like, oh, it smells like maple syrup. So the mama mole says, I want to smell that too. So she goes and sticks her head out of the mole hole and sniffs, and he goes, smells like honey to me. So the baby mole does not want to be left out of this. So he says, let me try to get out of there. But, you know, his mama mole, papa pole is blocking the way. He's trying to get, he just can't fit. And he's like, all I smell is a bunch of molasses here. <laughs> The pinnacle of dad jokes. <laughs> Just gonna go in on that one. That's it. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's talk about urinary incontinence. Hopefully, none of your patients will have this today. Have any issues? But um, right. So what is this specifically? Right. This is involuntary leakage of urine. Obviously, um, there's some urgency that can be associated with this as well. Um, typically, you'll find increased frequency both in the day and the nighttime, depending on kind of what the, the particular issues are. And obviously, this can lead to some secondary psychological effects, depression, anxiety, things like that, right? And so typically, you're going to find this to be more predominantly found in uh, female patients, especially uh, around the time of menopause. You can see, especially when estrogen levels start to drop down, that can affect some of the, um, uh, the smooth muscle around the urethra, which can lead to some of this. Also, it's another big event in a female's life that could lead to incontinence. Childbirth, right? You can find childbirth, you're going to find a lot of the anatomy tends to get pretty stretched out when you pass a human being through it. So you can end up finding some uh, incontinence associated with that. We'll talk about uh, the particular type of incontinence you can see. Um, and again, you're going to find that chronic urinary incontinence, especially in these older patients, is a frequent reason why they end up getting um, institutionalized and you get put into assisting living facilities and things like that um, because maybe they don't have the care at home to be able to uh, take care of them anymore. So looking at the lower urinary tract, we obviously know it's made up of the bladder, urethra, the, the sphincters. And then if you remember, we have two, we have an internal external sphincter. Which one is under our control? Conscious control. The external, right? And then we have the interior, which is going to be more under subconscious control, right? Um, Again, if you have any kind of impairment of either of those, that's when you can see the incontinence actually happen there. Uh, this is important to, again, go back to the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. We, we remember that what does acetylcholine do to the bladder? Cause the detrusor muscle to constrict, right? Because again, you think about your, uh, what's the mnemonic we use for our muscarinic sort of side effects or effects? Remember the dumbbells? What was the U in dumbbells? Urination, right? So again, when you see the muscarinic activity activating there on the detrusor muscle, you're going to see constriction of that smooth muscle, and that should lead to micturation, right? Um, what's it going to do to that internal urethral sphincter? Uh, it tends to relax that, right? So again, these are working in concert with one another. And again, thinking back to the flip side of that, we're talking about the effects of things like um, uh, alpha adrenergic agonist and, and things that, like the sympathetic nervous system. What does that do to the bladder, typically? Should relax it, right? Because again, if you're in that fight or flight response, you typically want to hold on to volume. You don't necessarily need to go to the bathroom, so you'll find that it will actually relax that detrusor muscle. Here, we're going to focus much more on the uh, cholinergic side of things, focus on those muscarinic receptors. These are the important things because this is what our drugs are going to be affecting here, right? So, do you think here, if we're going to be dealing with incontinence, do you think we want to use muscarinic agonist or antagonist? Probably antagonist, because you remember, if you go back to your mnemonic for um, uh, anti-muscarinics. What was the mnemonic? Remember they're dry as a bone, right? So again, you're going to lead to urinary retention. So you can find that by using anti-muscarinics, this is going to be important to um, cause you to hold on to that urine more effectively. It's going to loosen up that detrusor muscle. It's going to help to increase that pressure on that internal urethral sphincter. Hopefully you can hold on to the urine better. So you're going to find anti-muscarinics are a big, um, playing a big role here, okay? Again, I don't really care if you know it's M2 or M3, just know there's different subtypes. Um, certain drugs may be more preferential for one versus another, but clinically it doesn't really matter too much. Okay, so as I mentioned, we have the proximal, the internal urethral sphincter is going to be more under involuntary control versus the external, which is under our voluntary control. Now, again, is that always going to be under our voluntary control? Not necessarily. If you have enough urine, enough pressure, like eventually that's going to come out um, uh, under involuntary means there. Um, Keep in mind with the bladder, you know, this should be allowing to fill for 
you know, should accommodate for varying degrees of volume there. However, there's always going to be limits to, to a lot of those. And you can find the patients that chronically um, hold their urine too much, they can actually have some issues there where that muscle tends to hypertrophy in response to that really, that, uh, the over distension you're going to see there. Um, but again, you need to have good coordination between the different organs, uh, nervous system, bladder, et cetera, in order to make all this work as it should. So getting into the different types of incontinence here, we have stress urinary incontinence, which I'm using my laser pointer so you can see what I'm pointing to. Um, this is typically what you're going to see um, more like in your pregnant patients or patients who have had uh, previous um, vaginal births, especially. Uh, we have this urethral underactivity, okay? So this is where you're going to find that that muscle may not be uh, sufficient enough to really have good closing pressures, and you're going to see uh, urine leakage through there. Um, and so this is where you're going to see it occur with you know, brief bouts of uh, stress on that uh, urethral sphincter, right? So you can find things like um, bursts of activity like sneezing or exercise can cause um, the pressures to uh, kind of overcome what the sphincter can really handle, and it's going to allow for leakage of urine to happen there, okay? Um, typically, do you think the volumes are going to be pretty high with this, pretty low? So pretty low, right? Because again, it's a brief bout. So you sneeze, it's a very brief event. You have a brief amount of leakage, not very high volumes there, right? So it's still problematic for the patient, right? So you don't want to have involuntary urination, but it still is going to find typically low volumes here. More episodic as well. Again, if it's just related to certain stressors, sneezing, coughing, et cetera. As I mentioned, with the risk factors, they're having like a vaginal delivery, pregnancy, childbirth, um, menopause, obesity, aging, all these things can increase the risk for that as the muscle tends to um, get less and less effective over time. Fairly rare in men, but it could be caused by surgery. So specifically like prostate surgery, you can see that as a uh, as an outcome of that. So that's one thing to note there. And this tends to be aggravated by drugs, okay? So for instance, if I were to use something like an alpha antagonist, you remember what did the alpha antagonist do for, say, the prostate? Cause relaxation of that smooth muscle, if you remember that, right? We use things like doxazosin, we look at things like uroxetrol, Flomax, Tamsulosin, right? These are all things that we're going to help to cause relaxation of that smooth muscle. The same thing happens on the urethra there. And so you can find the alpha antagonist tends to relax that smooth muscle, causing potentially stress incontinence happening there. Um, and then you can also see things like ACE and ARBs. More often, you're going to see with the ACE inhibitors. And if you remember, what is a big side effect of the ACE inhibitors? Dry cough. Why do they get the dry cough? You get that bradykinin buildup. Now, you see this less with the ARBs for sure. And again, a lot of patients who have chronic dry cough with the ACE inhibitors will switch over to ARB to get rid of that. Um, but just know that could be another cause for the stress incontinence, right? So if you have an older, uh, say, you know, a woman, say in her 50s, which again is not older, but, you know, just say she's in her 50s, um, you know, previous, you know, two child births, um, you know, is on a start on an ACE inhibitor, now she's complaining of urinary incontinence. This is one of those things that could be related back to that. Say, are you having a lot of coughs with, uh, you, you've noticed since you started your lisinopril? And say, yes, I have. And then that could kind of clue you into what's going on. So um, the other uh, type here is going to be this urge, urinary incontinence. So again, it's not stress, but it's an urge. And this is typically going to be due to bladder overactivity. And this is where you're going to see a lot of our anti clinics are playing a big role here. And so again, you're going to find that leakage is associated with the urgency or that desire to avoid. And then typically this is going to be detrusor overactivity due to involuntary contractions, right? And so you're going to find that having that detrusor muscle being too um, overactive, causing too much constriction is going to lead to that urge to, to need to, to avoid. Um, again, this is not the same as overactive bladder. So this is more of an issue of urgency versus frequency, okay, as you'll see. Um, typically, this could be either due to a neurologic condition. So you can see things like um, chronic bladder outlet obstructions, neurologic disease can cause this, or just aging in general can lead to this as well. Um, but keep in mind that anytime you have a diuretic on board, this can lead to... Um, kind of increase urine volumes, which can lead to, again, that increased urgency to, to urinate. Um, and again, why would alcohol be playing a role here? Yeah, it suppresses ADH secretion, remember? So again, if you're suppressing antidiuretic hormones, it's gonna have a diuretic sort of effect. Um, so whether it's your ACE inhibitors, your thiazides, or even alcohol, that can all cause a diuresis sort of effect there. Uh, the overflow incontinence is actually going to be kind of a mixture of urethral overactivity and or bladder underactivity, as you'll see here. And basically what you're going to find is this leakage is due to the bladders being way too overdistended here. It's getting uh, way too full. It's unable to empty there. And this leads to this chronic urinary retention. So this is something you'll see with patients who are, say, chronic on um, say antihistamines that have strong anticholinergic activity. This is something that could lead to that. Um, and again, you're going to find this urethral hyperactivity is usually going to be due to things like BPH in men, which is most common, which makes sense because we know that the uh, prostate is too large and is impinging upon the urethra, so that's overactivity there. And then you can also see this for certain neurologic con uh, conditions like MS or spinal cord injuries. You can also see that. And then bladder underactivity, 
when you're going to be seeing that's not going to be completely um, avoiding all of its contents there. Um, could be due to things like long-term outlet obstruction, like due to BPH, right? That's some of those long-term urinary uh, tract uh, sequelae. You can see that, that LUTs there uh, that we talked about yesterday. And then diabetes is another thing that could lead to that as well. So uh, looking at the medications here, so things are going to have uh, increased urethral hyperactivity, as we mentioned, are going to be things that are um, uh, maybe things like alpha agonists, right? So just like we said, an alpha antagonist will cause relaxation of the prostate, an alpha agonist. Does anyone know what an alpha agonist might be? So like over-the-counter meds, like you got a cold, you're all stuffy. Sudafed's a big one, right? So again, any sort of stimulant sort of medication there. Um, you can even think about things like amphetamines, like ADHD meds potentially. We have more and more adults who are taking ADHD meds for adult ADHD, so you can find uh, that may be playing a role here. TCAs are another big one. And again, why would TCAs lead to this? They're anticholinergic, right? So again, by being anticholinergic, you're gonna see this can lead to some urethral hyperactivity. And then looking at things that, uh, medications that decrease bladder contractility, so again, causing that urinary retention so that you're not avoiding all that volume, are going to be things like anticholinergics, TCAs, as I mentioned, antipsychotics, especially like chlorpromazine, uh, chlorpropamide, things like that are going to be playing a role here. And then calcium channel blockers. Why calcium channel blockers? They relax that smooth muscle, right? Again, just like it, it should preferentially be acting on the vascular smooth muscle, but it can affect other smooth muscles as well. If you remember what's a big side effect of things like um, uh, amlodipine, let's say on the GI tract. Constipation is a big one, right? Because you're slowing down that, that calcium influx on the GI smooth muscle. Same thing can happen here to the urethral smooth, or the, the detrusor muscle, and that's going to cause you to hold on to more of that volume there, right? So that's another rare side effect, but something you can see if you start to combine a bunch of these Say you have a patient who has uh, depression, they're on amitriptyline, but they're also on amlodipine for their blood pressure. You can start to see how these meds will um, kind of synergize and can cause this urinary retention. So how they're going to present, obviously, is going to depend on the pathophysiology, whether it's bladder under overactivity, whether it's urethral under overactivity there. Um, obviously, if it's urethral underactivity, this is going to be more associated with that physical exertion. So let's say they're running or coughing, sneezing, things like that. The bladder overactivity tends to be associated with this frequency and urgency, right? So I'm going to say more than eight times a day or so, even if it's small volumes, it still have that frequency associated with that. And then the overflow is usually associated with a lot of um, abdominal fullness because, again, they're not holding on to a lot of that extra volume there. Um, they may have frequency and urgency associated with that. So, and of course, um, the course of therapy depends on what's really bothersome to the patient, right? So some people can do well with just having um, things like adult diapers, like, you know, depends and things like that, you know, but it depends on the volume, the frequency, um, et cetera. And again, what's tolerable by the patient, right? Because this can be something that could be having a significant effect on their quality of life. So, you know, what are they going to be able to work with? So our goals, uh, restore continence. Hopefully we can reduce the number of episodes. And again, we may not be able to get them down to zero, but hopefully we can reduce the number and then try to prevent any complications. So especially if you can keep people out of the nursing homes, that can be really helpful. Because again, what happens when people get in the nursing homes? Hmm? They decline, like mental status declines, dementia gets worse. What happens from an infectious disease standpoint? They spread around all these really resistant bugs because, again, they get they catch a pneumonia, they go to the hospital, they get a hospital-acquired pneumonia, they go back to the nursing home, guess what, they pass it on to their buddies to Ethel and Gerald next door down. And guess what, now they have these really resistant bugs and they come in and they get even heavier antibiotics. And so it's just kind of a sick cycle you see with this. Um, so again, a lot of big issues, right? They're not being cared for. They may not be uh, vigilantly as they would be at home. So again, you can find uh, they may get dehydrated. They may not uh, have good intake. And so that can lead to things like acute kidney injury, all kinds of problems. So more you can keep people out of the, out of the nursing home, assisted living facilities are better off for the most part. And this can help with that. So generally, you're going to find that um, if you can try to institute non-pharmacologic therapy first, right, and this can be including things like abdominal floor exercises, this can include things like absorbent pads, um, this is when drug therapy is going to be coming into play here. Um, in some cases, we may find that using both non- and pharmacologic therapy together is obviously going to be somewhat synergistic, so that can be useful. Um, and we'll find that the drug selection is based on the actual type of incontinence. We'll look at some different options there in just a second. And again, consider the comorbidities. Do they have hypertension? Do they have diabetes? What other things they have going on um, that could be playing a role here? 
So as you mentioned, non-farm is going to be first line. Again, better for more mild to moderate symptoms here. And this includes things like their lifestyle modifications or changing their toileting schedules. Maybe they know they're going to have to go frequently. You know, maybe they can try to schedule around that. A pelvic floor rehabilitation, like doing your Kegel exercises and things like that can all be very helpful. And of course, any caregivers, especially if you're dealing with more elderly patients, need to be able to help out with this as, as well. So, but let's look at the medications here. They're going to be used most commonly. And so, as I mentioned, for the urge urinary incontinence, anticholinergics are going to be first line here, right? And again, we already know a lot of what the side effects of these drugs are going to be. The mnemonic being Mazahatter, dries a bone, which is what we're going for here, right? Where's the beat? Line is a bat. How does the hair, right? So, those are the big things, right? What does it do to your heart rate? Typically increases it, right? So again, you're going to find that a lot of these tend to be a little bit more specific for those anti, uh, those muscarinic receptors there in the bladder, but you can find some bleed over effects, right? You can find that patients maybe who have um, issues with their vision, maybe having blurred vision associated with this, right? You may find patients who have a history of dysrhythmia may have their heart rate go up somewhat, and they may see this can do things like affecting oxygen demands and, and whatnot. So just things to consider, right? So uh, some of the more common ones you're going to run into include things like oxybutynin, tolteridine, uh, trospium. Solafenacin, darafenacin, and physoteridine. And again, they're just working by blocking those muscarinic receptors there on the detrusor muscle. It's going to cause the bladder muscle to relax or constrict. For incontinence, we're trying to, especially for that urge urinary incontinence, we want it to relax, right? We're hoping to hold on to more volume so that way they don't have that urge to go to the bathroom as frequently as they did before, right? So by holding on to more volume, you don't have that pressure there that is leading to that, that reflex is, hey, we need to go to the bathroom, right? Any of these are considered equally effective. Um, a lot of it can depend on uh, the dosing strategies, right? So if you have to give it, let's say, more than one time a day, the cost is going to be playing a role here, side effect profiles, et cetera. Uh, if you notice here, when you see like an XL formulation, obviously that means what? So the pill's like this big, XL. <laughs> no, it means long lasting, right? It's going to be lasting throughout the day. LA just means long acting, right? Um, and again, so that's going to be useful because it's just one time day dosing, right? Potentially. Maybe 12 in some cases, but usually just one time daily dosing. Again, that can help with compliance because a lot of these patients, as they get older, what does their medication list do? It increases exponentially in some cases, right? So again, by adding one of these on, you want to make sure you can think about the compliance standpoint and think, think about what they're going to be able to, to handle. So uh, as I mentioned, anticholinergics are first line. Uh, a lot of them are going to be coming either in uh, long acting formulations. Transdermal formulations are also useful, especially if you want to change them every few days or so, because that helps with compliance. Um, and again, remember the anticholinergic mnemonic to know the common side effects associated with that, right? So you can see hyperthermia, you can see the heart rate go up, you can see blurred vision, you can see all those things associated with that, uh, these medications based off their anti-muscarinic activity. Now, again, who would be contraindicated from this? Uh, they have urinary retention already, which probably wouldn't be their big issue in the first place with this urge urinary incontinence. If they have decreased GI motility, because what's this going to do to GI motility? It's going to slow it down even more, right? So if they already have significant constipation because they're on amlodipine or verapamil and they're on a chronic opioid for long-term back pain, guess what? They're going to get stopped up even worse when they're on one of these medications here, right? So again, always consider these things. Um, Narrow angle glaucoma, again, is going to be contraindicated because it can negatively affect that. Um, Mycenae gravis, all these things are going to be a big issue. Also think about the mental status changes that can occur with this. You know, they um, you can definitely see an increased risk for falls for these older patients because, um, again, they don't have a lot of hemodynamic reserves. So it's a very common thing to see that. Okay. As far as mental status changes goes, mm -hmm. one injury actually just causes delirium. Is that a big concern when you do an anticholinergic to an elderly person? Always. Yeah, you always want to be consider of that. And if you have to use one, right, so what can we do to try to mitigate some of those delirium causing sort of effects? Try lower doses, right, try to titrate very slowly if you can. Make sure you're monitoring for those changes there. So if you see that all of a sudden they're getting, you know, patients, caregivers are reporting, yeah, they're actually just way more loopy than usual. Like those are things you want to key in on, right? Because um, again, the patient's probably not going to be able to notice all that much. They may say, I'm just not feeling right. But if they can't really communicate that, then you have to rely on the, the other caregivers and whatnot to try to help you out with that. But yeah, anytime you're given anticholinergic, Benadryl, any antipsychotic, um, and we'll talk about this in the geriatric section coming up um, leading into this. Um, but yeah, that's always a, a big concern there for sure. Um, and again, especially it gets tough when you're dealing with patients, elderly patients, like you put them in the hospital setting, because what happens when they kind of get out of their normal environment? They get that sundowning effect, right? And again, it's not just that sundown, but that's when you typically see it. But again, they're in an uncomfortable environment. They don't know who these people are. They're coming in and messing with them every hour. Um, so it can be very, um, very challenging to determine, okay, is this dementia-related sundowning? Is it the medications it's doing? Is it a combination? 
who knows, right? So it can be very, very tough. Um, even me, like when I was uh, with my wife, when we had uh, both of our babies and we were only in the hospital maybe like a day or two, like having those nurses come in like every single hour, they were like, oh, this is like a big benefit. Like you know, it had big signs, our nurses come in every single hour. I'm like, no, stop, like leave us alone. Like, you know, I was getting like really antsy. I'm like, can we get out of here like right now? This, is, this place is terrible. It was a great hospital, but it's still like, it's just hospitals aren't great places to be and I feel comfortable. Anyway, so, um, as I mentioned, these are first line. Typically, extended release preparations are better from the compliance standpoint. Um, oxybutynin is a good one because it has, um, or uh, it's good because it has an XL formulation. However, you want to be careful for patients at risk for hypo or orthostatic hypotension. Does, it does have a little bit of that alpha blockade, so you do want to be careful with that one. It may have some effects on blood pressure, lowering a little bit, so just be careful. Um, other big things to note here as well is that these XL formulations typically you can always find these lists. Just look up a do not crush or chew list and you can always find this online. Um, but a lot of these XL formulations are designed that if you were to crush or chew them or cut them in half or something like that, it will break that extended release formulation. And then what happens when the patient takes that dose? All comes out at once. Yeah. So again, they're going to see this really big peak effect and then it may not last throughout the time period. You may see those kind of big side effects early on. And so that's always a concern, right? So if you think about like your Toprol XLs, right, your beta blockers, anything like that, always double check just to see if it's something that can be split, uh, if it's something that can be crushed or chewed, because oftentimes you'll end up breaking that formulation and that's going to um, kind of defeat the whole purpose of using an XL formulation in the first place, right? So there's something to note. Uh, Tolteridine is another one you want to avoid in patients with significant renal dysfunction or severe hepatic dysfunction because you will find levels will increase and you can see more toxicities. And also if they're on a CYP3A4 inhibitor, such as, anyone know any good CYP3A4 inhibitors? Cymetidine is a good one. What's some other ones? Hmm? Ketocarm is also a good one. Macrolides. What else? But like verapamil, deltiazem, right? So think of all these common CYP3A4 inhibitors um, that can you up your dose, you know, up your level. So you want to go ahead and drop your dose initially, right? Because just because they're on a CYP3A4 inhibitor doesn't mean they can't take the drug. It just means you may need to adjust the dose to uh, accommodate for that, right? Um, Trochamine is actually kind of a second generation anticholinergic. And so one of the benefits of this is if you remember talking about the gen uh, differences between a first and a second generation antihistamine, what was the difference? doesn't cause sedation in the, in the second generations, how come? I can't cross that blood-brain barrier. And a lot of it was due to the fact that it was a quaternary ammonium. And again, going back to your organic chemistry, what does a quaternary ammonium mean? It's quaternary, so it's not tertiary, which is three, so quaternary is four. Right, so when you put four charges on there, it's going to cause a permanent positive charge, right? So because of that, um, or that nitrogen has four charges on it, four bonds, you're going to find it has a permanent positive charge. And so because of that, you're going to find that it does not cross that blood-brain barrier very easily. So the benefit here is you're going to get less of those um, ultramental status sort of effect because it can't cross the blood-brain barrier as readily. So I mean that none of it, or that none of it crosses, probably not. There's probably still a little bit, but trospin might be a better option for a patient who uh, maybe they're elderly, maybe you started them on something like a uh, detrol. And you're just going to kind of getting a little loopy. Try switching something like this, and it may help to mitigate some of those effects there. Okay. Um, again, think about things like dietary restrictions, like uh, it has poor bioavailability, have to take it on an empty stomach. You know, it's really kind of interesting. It's a good point. I don't know if I mentioned it. So um, some of the, your colleagues did a uh, talk to some of the Parkinson's patients, and I mentioned the lady was talking about her diet. So going back to neurology, if you remember back in Parkinson's, what was the big thing you had to worry about? Cinemet and your diet. Cinemet was uh, the brand name for, oh boy, to Parkinson's, think levodopa, carbidopa, right? Remember, what did that compete with in terms of getting absorbed in the GI tract? Levodopa is a, an amino acid, so it means it would compete with other amino acids. Where do you find a lot of amino acids? And your protein, right? So again, this is one of those things where I mentioned that sometimes if you're having decreased effects of the cinnamon, you had to adjust it and make sure you weren't taking it at the same time as a lot of protein. And so it was interesting talking to those patients because one of them was like, yeah, I have to make sure I, I don't eat my eggs at the same time as I eat my cinnamon. Otherwise, I'm going to have increased effects of the Parkinson's all, all day long, right? So again, take these things into account here. So if you have a patient not really responding well to something like trospium, maybe they need to take it on an empty stomach, right? But think about other medications they're taking. Think about if they're taking calcium they have osteoporosis think about they're taking iron because they have uh, anemia think about all these different drug interactions and it can be very difficult when you're trying to uh, and again this is, bleeds a lot into the geriatrics talk but it gets very complicated in terms of trying to schedule these things out and again when you have declining mental status in terms of getting older that becomes much more difficult right so that's why you see all those pill minders and all these different things to try to help schedule you out um you know 
people are using a lot of um, you know, phone apps and things like that that can help them out, trying to schedule things out, using a lot of timers and things. Um, but again, it can be very difficult and get complicated pretty quickly. Um, now, botulinum toxin, what does this normally do? Cause of paralysis. Why does it cause paralysis? Good job. You read, read the slide right. Yes. It blocks the release of acetylcholine. Okay. So, again, how do you think that might affect the detrusor muscle of the bladder? It should relax it, right? Because if you're not releasing acetylcholine, you shouldn't be able to affect that. And again, this is another big thing that affects skeletal muscle as well. So, how, when you typically think of Botox, how's it being used? For aesthetic purposes, right? You can inject it into the forehead, and all of a sudden you can't you get the you get the you get that surprise look all the time, you know. Um, but basically, you're going to find this is used as an off-label use. You can actually inject this directly into the bladder, and it has a good long half-life. So you're going to find that it will last for for several months at a time. Um, but it will allow for by paralyzing some of that muscle. Now, again, you're not going to paralyze the entire muscle, but by paralyzing some of it, you can help to uh, allow for getting better filling, allow to help decrease a lot of that urge or that frequency that is going to be associated with urge urinary incontinence. And so that can be used occasionally. Now, again, would this be a first-line thing you'd jump to? No, but if they are not good candidates for anticholinergics, if they fail other therapy, then they can try using Botox. Now, again, um, this would probably be an inpatient sort of procedure or they have to go to the OR in order to have this done. And in fact, we do this pretty frequently for um, all kinds of things. We'll do this for chronic migraines. Um, we'll do this for um, certain GI conditions. Some of our GI docs will actually use Botox um, to help uh, paralyze parts of the intestines and try to help decrease overactivity. So there's lots of different ways we can um, help to utilize Botox for these patients here. But most of it's off-label, um, but it doesn't mean you can't use it that way. Anyway, um, so some things you can consider uh, as far as adverse effects. So you can see some dysuria, some urinary retention. Of course, why does that make sense? Yeah, because you're, you're paralyzing that muscle, right? So again, you may not have this effect of uh, voiding pressures developed because you can't necessarily use all that muscle. You can't recruit all that muscle at the same time. So that could be an issue there. And UTIs also just do some of that stasis there within the bladder. That's something to consider. Other things. Um, Looking at urethral underactivity, so what are some things we can use to try to increase that, that closing pressure on the urethra? Well, in some cases, estrogens can be used here. And in fact, why do we say menopausal women were more likely to see some of this urethral underactivity? What happens to their estrogen levels? They tend to go down, right? So by replacing estrogen in some of these patients, you may find you have uh, increased activity here. You're going to find more proliferation of that urethral epithelium. So again, you're going to get tighter closing pressures there, get better local circulation, uh, and actually more alpha receptors. So again, you have that fight or flight response. You have that norepi epi going there. You're going to find you have better activity, so you get better closing pressures, which can be a good thing. Um, so again, this goes back to talking about our... Um, different formulations of estrogens there. We talked about transdermal, we talked about vaginal delivery, all these different options here. Same thing still apply. Um, you can either use this orally, any of those are going to be fine. Um, vaginally, you should still see some local effects happening there, so that could still get some, some additional benefits. So if they're complaining of a lot of vaginal dryness and also some of those urge urinary incontinence, um, this could be useful for those patients there, right? So by applying intravaginal um, estrogens, you can get some local activity there in the urethra as well. Uh, and again, what's kind of the benefit of using just intravaginal estrogens? Yeah, you see less systemic effects overall, less um, uh, liver effect, hepatic effects, you're going to see less you know, clotting effects, things like that. Okay. Um, typically, you're going to find progestins are going to have an antagonistic effect here. So again, if you had a patient who, say, maybe didn't have an intact uterus and, and or had a history of had a hysterectomy in their past, uh, progestins don't need to be included there because that can actually kind of um, uh, compete with the estrogen effects that you'll see there. Um, now, again, overall, the, uh, the efficacy may be somewhat questionable. Typically, you're giving these estrogens for other purposes anyway. So, again, if you see some additional benefit, that is going to be fine. That's great. Um, most of the time, patients will mostly uh, be recommended just to use the, the transdermal formulation. So, if you're using it specifically for UI, um, transdermal is going to be the one that most is often recommended. Okay. Um, again, other things that can help to uh, increase urethral closure, well, this is where we can use things like alpha receptor agonists. And in fact, for a while, we used things like phenylpropanolamine or PPA. If you ever see that, that's what it's referring to. However, we didn't like to use it anymore because if I were just to give an alpha agonist, what are some other systemic effects you might see? If I cause activation of alpha-1 receptors, what does that do to the cardiovascular system? Hypertension, right? Because you're going to be constricting those vessels, so you can expect to see blood pressure go up. Is that good for a lot of patients? No, nope. so it caused a lot of them to stroke out or have heart attacks, and so that's why PPA was taken off the market. You actually find a lot of um, uh, dietary uh, stimulants 
they were used for weight loss also tend to be in this kind of category here. And a lot of them got taken off the market as well because they're causing people to stroke out or have heart attacks. Um, however, there's some other ways we can try to modify the system a little bit. If they say we're a good candidate for uh, some of these other therapies here, we can actually use something like duloxetine or some Balta. And so again, how does this work to activate those alpha receptors? How do you think? See, N and SNRI. Norepinephrine, right? So it's selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So by affecting that norepi, by increasing those levels there at the synapse, you may get better activity on those alpha-1 receptors and hopefully a little bit better urethral closure, right? So again, this is helping with that pathway there. It's actually approved specifically for this uh, stress urinary incontinence in Europe. Um, and again, it's used to help increase that urethral tone, okay? Again, is it gonna be perfect? Probably not, but again, it could be useful if they're not a good candidate for other things. Or if they have concomitant depression, it could be a good option for them as well, right? Okay, and as far as the overflow incontinence, again, we talked about, um, you know, the, a lot of that in the BPH as far as things like uh, dealing with the prostate, you know, things like that. Again, a lot of it is going to be related to um, avoiding anticholinergics because, again, usually the bladder is over distended at that point anyway. So those are things you want to avoid typically for those patients, but that's pretty much it as far as incontinence goes. So any questions on that section? If not, um, do you want to do a quick break now? I'm not going to go the full time. Do you want a quick break now and then come back and do Jerry? Yeah, okay, let's do 10 and we'll come back and then start the next section.